Okay. So as I said, we finished last week um, going through that long list of blessings. We actually, there was one blessing we didn't cover. We're going to start with that one now. And we explained where those blessings come from, that originally they were designed to be said at home as you do each step, as you stand up, you recite this blessing, as you put on your shoes, you recite that blessing, etc. Uh, nowadays, can we say them all in one package? As I said, we say them at home. There are some who still say them in shul because of the old custom when people didn't know how to daven, um, and they recite them aloud, everybody says amen. Chabad customs, we recite them at home, which is how they were initially initially and originally intended. So now, let's continue on in the Siddur. Where are we? Here we are. Okay. The last blessing in that list of blessings is this one. Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu melech haolam, hama'avir sheina, me'inoi, usnuma, so that's basically, blessed are you, Hashem. Let's go down here. King of the universe who removes sleep from my eyes and slumber from my eyelids. Okay? That's the last of the blessings. And that blessing is mentioned in the Talmud as well. It's actually mentioned first, but for whatever reason, do that blessing last. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, even in shuls where they have the custom to recite those blessings aloud, when they do so, they don't recite that one aloud, and nobody answers amen to that one. And you see right over here, it says here, do not respond amen. Okay, now um, I'm just gonna ask a, a logistical question, Yossi. Um, question, Yossi. Do you see the top of my share screen or you don't? Um, you see the I'm window? Where sure. I'm not sure what's mine in here, so I can't answer that. Oh, all right, never mind. Then. Okay, anyway, moving on. So, we now have the next paragraph, and let's th look through it. And may it be the will of God, and may it be your will, Hashem our God, the God of our fathers. Now, it's interesting because. Most paragraphs don't start with and, and the word V, he, starting with this letter vav means and may it be his will. Oddly enough, I don't know if this has ever bothered you, but if you look at the next, if you look at the next paragraph right after that, it's the word yehi ratzon, may it be the will, milfanecha before you, Hashem elokai, Hashem my God and the God of my father. They're very similar paragraphs, and in a strange way, <clears throat> the first paragraph says, and may it be your will. The second paragraph says, may it be your will. I think it should be the opposite. The first one starts with, may it be your will. The second one should be, <clears throat> the he wrote own. and may it be your will. But the reason for that is as follows. The reason is that this paragraph, Vihi Ratzon, is the main paragraph that belongs here, okay? And it's meant to be a continuation of these blessings. After we've said all of these blessings, we're saying, and now in conclusion, and may it be your will, etc., etc., etc. So this is really, so to speak, the last blessing in the list. And in fact, you'll see this paragraph ends with a blessing. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you God, HaGomel chasadim tovim liyamo Yisrael, who ex extends kindness to his nation of Israel. So you see in the end, this really is one of the blessings, and it, it's a continuation from the paragraph before. <coughs> and it's basically connecting to the last blessing, which had said, we awaken when we awaken, that you remove slumber from our eyes once we awaken, and may it be your will. Now let's look through the paragraph and see exactly what it is that it says. And may it be your will before you. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem our God, 
and the God of our fathers. Now, mind you, again, I don't know if you noticed this, if it ever, ever bothered you, but that next paragraph, similar, may it be your will, but it says, Hashem Elokai, Hashem my God, Elokai the God of my father. How come the first paragraph is plural and the next one is singular? We're going to get back to that soon. But in the meantime, Okay, you should make us familiar with your Torah. We should be used to it. We should be regular in it. And we should cleave to your mitzvahs. And don't bring us not to sin. And not to, these are three different words that all mean sin. Chet. Avera and Avon. They're all different styles of sin and they're all different terminologies of sin. So we're poetically saying, God, you should not bring us to sin. Not only that, the lowly day nisoyon. And don't bring us to temptation or tests. You know, sometimes a person will say, I want God to test me so that I can prove myself. We don't want God to test us. We beg God, please don't test us. Now, in the world of testing, just a very interesting story to share. It happened once, and this was in the times, I believe, of the Rebbe Maharash, the fourth Chabad Rebbe. And living in the Rebbe Maharash's community, there were two people whose name was Shloima. It was a common name, Shloima. One guy was known as Big Shloima. He was a big, tall guy. He was a rich man. He had really good business. He had an import-export business. He was a real somebody. The other guy was known as Little Shloima. He was a short guy. Didn't make too much money. He always struggled. He borrowed money to start the new business for which he borrowed money to pay the old business. And it was an ongoing situation with him. It was always very difficult. <clears throat> One day in the shul of the Rebbe Marash, somebody came running in out of breath, said, I just came from the harbor. And I saw that the police have seized the boat that has the shipment for Little Schleima of his imports. Now, it turned out that Little Schleima had made a decision. He's got to get out of this rut. And so he decided to get out of the rut. What he's going to do is he's going to borrow money from everyone he can. He's going to buy merchandise. He's going to bring it in. He's going to sell it. And this is going to be his big hit. This is going to be the one time he makes enough money to pay off that debt and all the other debts. And he's invested in everything. This is it. It's make it or break it. Now they come in and they tell him, little Shlema, we just heard that your shipment has been seized by the government. Now, mind you, if customs seizes your, your stuff here in America, which many years ago used to be a free country, well, it's not an easy thing to deal with. The bureaucracy, the difficulty, you never know. You're, you're, you're at their hands. You never know. You get one angry bureaucrat who's gotten a raise and a promotion from having worked in the DMV, and you never know. Now, we're talking about czarist Russia, and the government has seized the property of a shipment. They're going to do whatever they want with it, not to mention that it's a Jew. Little Shloyme hears this news, and he is beside himself with fear and panic and pain. And he collapses. He literally collapses from the stress. <clears throat> they try to revive him. Nothing doing. They can't. And every time they wake him up, he starts to come to. He remembers the news that they just told him, which is that, in fact, his shipment has been seized. And he faints again. And they, they don't know what to do there. They're yelling for doctors. And suddenly they notice that the Rebbe's wife, Rebbe Rivka, was there. She was present at the time. And they said to her, please, go run home. Go to your husband, to the Rebbe, and ask him for a bracha, because we fear for his life the way he's responding, reacting here. Sure enough, she did. And she gets to the Rebbe, and she tells the Rebbe the story, and the Rebbe looks at her and he says, well, what is he worrying about? It's not his shipment that was taken. It's go right now back to the shul and tell them it's not his shipment, it's big Shleimah's shipment that was seized. He has nothing to worry about. His stuff is all intact. It's all good. So she hears this. She runs back to the shul. She gives them the news. And as she gives them the news, they wake him up. They tell him, it's not your shipment. The Rebbe said, it's not your shipment. It's big Shleimah's shipment that was seized. You'll be fine. 
he starts to come to. Not two minutes later, someone comes running in and says, did you hear the news? It's not little Shlema's shipment. It's big Shlema's shipment at the harbor that was seized. Little Shlema's stuff is fine. Everyone said, Baruch Hashem. I mean, obviously, they feel bad for big Shlema. He'll handle it. Number one, he's got connections. He'll deal with the government. He pays off the right people. Number two, even if God forbid he'll lose this shipment, he'll be okay. So everyone says, Baruch Hashem. And then they looked at Rebetzin Rivka and they said, Rebetzin Rivka, how did you know? You didn't go to the harbor. You, you went to your husband. You went to the Rebbe. How did he know he wasn't at the harbor? There's no communication. And the Rebbe Marash used to always insist that he does not perform miracles. He doesn't perform miracles. So she went back and said to him, everybody wants to understand. It looks like you've performed a miracle because there's no way you could have known. One of two things happened. Either sitting here in your study, you had a vision and knew what's going on at the harbor, even though you didn't see it. Because I told you something and you told me the opposite. And that's miraculous. Or... In fact, it was little Shlema's shipment that was taken, and you performed some sort of a miracle, and now, no, nope, it looks like you changed reality, and big Shlema's shipment was taken. Explain yourself. So he looked at her and he said, I didn't perform any miracles. It was obvious. She says, how was it obvious? He said, you came and told me a story. You said little Shlema's shipment was taken. You said that he's fainting. You said that every time they wake him up, the minute he remembers the story that's happened, he can't, Pashat can't live. He can't sustain himself. He can't stay awake. He can't stay conscious. So one thing was clear to me. God doesn't test people with any type of test that they cannot overcome. God only tests people with tests that they're able to handle. The fact that little Shlemba was reacting the way he was reacting, one thing was clear. This was not his test because he couldn't handle it. So if this wasn't his test, whose test was it? Doesn't take much brains to realize there's two people named Shlema in the community. The other Shlema is very much into import and export. Obviously, it must be somebody else's test, the test that he could handle. And so I deduced it's big Shlema's shipment that was taken and everything will be fine. And kachav and so it was. So I told you all of that because we talk about God not testing us. And when God does test us, first of all, we ask him not to. Second of all, if he does, certainly whenever we feel we're being tested, we must realize that if we're being tested, it can only be because we are able to handle it. And that in and of itself should give us the strength to be able to overcome it. Having said that, let's get back to the words, we ask it should be the will of God not to bring us to be tested. And not to be embarrassed. We should never come to embarrassment or disgrace. And do not allow our Yetzirah, our evil inclination, to rule over us. And keep us far away from bad people and from bad friends. And now, the opposite of what we've just said. First, we said the Yetzirah shouldn't rule over us. And we should be kept away. We ask God to help keep us away from bad people and bad friends. The <coughs> Dabkein will be Eitzertayim. May we attach ourselves and cleave to the good inclination to the Eitzertayim. Ube masim tayivim. And to good deeds. The chayf es yitzreinu lehishtabed lach. And force our nature to dedicate ourselves to serving you. Usneinu hayayim v'chol yayim. And give to us today and every day for favor and kindness and compassion in your eyes. And may we be given over for kindness and compassion in your eyes and kindness and compassion for all that see us. And graciously bestow upon us goodness and kindness. Blessed are you gods who graciously bestows goodness to his nation Israel. So that's the paragraph. We're saying, now that we're awake, now that we have acknowledged, thank you God for awakening us with saying Moda'ani, saying the second Moda'ani, reciting the blessings that mark the stages of getting up and getting dressed and getting ourselves ready for the world and ready for life. Concluding on the words, and thank you God for removing the sleep from my eyes, we say, and now let's have a good day. 
in order to have a good day, we turn to God and we ask him that he should grant us all of these very, very important things that we've just asked for. And you'll see that the way it's done is we start off by asking God for, we go in three, in three levels here. The first thing we ask for is Torah. God, you should make us familiar with your Torah. That's number one. Then we address mitzvahs. And may you make us close, connect us to your mitzvahs. And then the third level is, and keep us away from sin. Now we have to realize Generally speaking, <clears throat> the normal order of events is what's known as sur meira va'asetov, which is avoid bad and do good. As a matter of fact, you see, just a little bit later on in this paragraph, we do follow that order. We say, avoid bad, al yishleit banu yitzhahara, don't let the yitzhahara rule us, Keep us away from bad man. We cover up from a bad friend, and then we say, "May we cleave to your yetsu type, in good deeds, etc." So that's the norm, which is sur meira. Stay away from bad, tov, and do good. Okay. <laughs> Having said that, even though that's the norm, because first you gotta have. And as it relates to in, in, in Hasidus, it's the, when we describe the, the Aved, when we describe the service of Hashem, we talk about serving Hashem's in, Hashem in two ways. There's iskafya, there's pushing away the bad and having willpower and self-control to refrain from those things that are bad. And then there's what's called ishabcha, or ishabcha chashucha l'nohira, which is transforming the bad or the darkness into light. So the first level is sur meira, keep it away. The next level is take even those things that are seemingly bad or materialistic and asay type and do good with them. Yet we find in this Mishnah, we find in this paragraph, we find now in this paragraph as follows, which is first we talk about Torah, then we talk about mitzvahs, and then we talk about keeping us away from sin. Because even though it may be true that a person normally first has to get to the level of pushing far away in order to get to the higher level of transforming the bad into good, <clears throat> by the same token, we also, A, have to have a foundation. And the foundation to even understand what it means to be kept away from bad is the foundation that comes from Torah and Mitzvahs. Ultimately, a person needs to be educated. Ultimately, a person needs to know what they're talking about. The biggest problem, the biggest problem in the world is not necessarily that people want to do bad. It's not that. You've got a world filled with people who all they want to do is good. The problem is they have no clue what good means because they're basing good. What happens is this. You ask somebody what's good. I know it's good if I feel it in my heart. If it feels right, it's good. It's not true at all. There's no truth to that whatsoever. Ultimately, good and bad, good and evil, are measured not by how it makes me feel. They're not measured by my level of compassion either. They're measured by how God tells us in Torah what's appropriate and what's not, what he wants and what he doesn't. That's good and bad. So in order to be able to keep ourselves away from bad, we have to understand what good and bad is. And that comes first and foremost from having the foundation of Torah and mitzvahs. When we have a foundation of Torah and mitzvahs, then we understand what good is and what bad is. Otherwise, you can have people who will dedicate their life with immense, immense self-sacrifice to do what? To do the wrong thing because they're not being guided by Torah and mitzvahs. They're being guided by their heart. They're being guided by society. They're being guided by some misguided person. <clears throat> Hence, we have in this paragraph that order. Moving on. Let's go to the next paragraph now. So now we have what looks like a very similar paragraph, except as I mentioned, it's not vihi, because it's not and, it's not a continuation. And it's singular, it's saying Hashem, my, my God, and the God of my Father. Now the reason for that is as follows. Aside from that paragraph that we just spoke, 
Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the author or the compiler of the Mishnah, and we learned of a Mishnah of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi in chapter 2 of Perkei Avos. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi had a personal prayer that he wrote. And he would recite this personal prayer every day at the end of Davin. You want to know what the prayer was? You're looking at it. This is the personal prayer that was originally written by <coughs> Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Hence, it's written in singular form. This is not part of the regular communal davening. This is not something that we normally, if you look almost all of the communal davening, we speak in plurals. Because I'm never only praying for myself in a, in a community. I'm praying for myself and everybody around me. However, it's interesting because there's, there's three levels. There's the norm, which is we pray. And while we pray for ourselves, we include everybody. And then there's the exception. One exception is this one. Where Rabbi Yehuda Anasi had a prayer that he specifically specifically designed as his own personal prayer. Aside from all the prayers that he did for himself and for the community, this was his. He said, God, I want to speak to you alone for a minute. And we'll learn this in a moment. There's another level of prayer, which is a prayer specifically and only for the community. You know, on Shabbos, there's the three paragraphs that we say after Torah reading, after the Haftorah, as we're getting ready for Musa. <clears throat> the first one is Yukum Porkan. Yukum Porkan Min Shemaya. Then we have a second paragraph, which is almost identical words. And then the third one, which ends with etc. So you'll, you may have noticed, now that we're diving at home every week, and God willing, we should be able to return to Shul very soon. You may have noticed that we only say the first paragraph, but we don't say the second Yukum and we don't say the Mishaberach when we're not with the Minyan. And the reason for that is because those two paragraphs are specifically prayers for the community standing around us. That's where we're saying, God, do me a favor, please, and bless these people standing around me. So when we're by ourselves, it's inappropriate to say that because we're not in the presence of the community. So that's the other side of the exception. This is the complete singular prayer. Yehudah Nasi was speaking for himself. That's the one that which is only communal. And then we have the... Regular prayers, which are for ourselves, but as we pray for ourselves, we of course always are praying for everyone else as well. Having said that, <clears throat> this is a very similar prayer than the uh, as the other one, which is why they ultimately made it part of the public davening and juxtaposed it right here. I like the word juxtaposed in case you were interested, because it's very similar to the paragraph we just read. So they put it here, and basically it says. Um, May it be the will of Hashem. May it be your will. Hashem alaykai velakei avisai. Again, Rabbi Huda was saying, My God and the God of my fathers, Shatati leinu hayom, that you should save me today, ubekol yom, and every day, me aze panim, or me azus panim, which basically means in a nutshell from all types of, 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 of haughtiness, etc. May adam ra, from a bad person, or me chaver ra, from a bad friend, or me shachin ra, and it goes into all the other bad types of people bad neighbors, and let's see how he describes over here Pegara, the, the English translation here. From, 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 from an, an evil occurrence, but it all, sometimes we even can refer to a person as, a, as Pegara as being an evil occurrence. So, anyway, Back to our paragraph. May I and hara from, from an evil eye, may lush and hara from evil words, evil tongue, me malshinus from slander, may aidus sheker from false testimony, me sinas abrias from hating of the creations, may alila from other types of false accusations, me misa mishuna from God forbid uh, an unnatural death, may chaloyim rayim from bad types of. of, of, of Sicknesses, illness, and plagues, etc. We make and run all other types of bad happenings. We suck on a mashtas from the destroying Satan. We din kashef from a harsh um, judgment. We bal din kashef from someone who is the the what in charge of the harsh ju judgment, meaning that we shouldn't be put in front of somebody who has that kind of power over us. Bein ben bris, bein shein ben bris. Whether he's one of us, whether he's of not one of us, meaning not from the Jewish people. We dinah shel gehinim and from the 
God forbid, the jaw, the, 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 the laws or, the, or the, the, the justice of purgatory. So it's his personal prayer that he would ask of God every day. Okay. That ends. You have a question? Hold on, please. And you had a question? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Th does that say Mlachim Raim also? Chalayim Raim. Machlim Raim. Machal Ume Chalayim Raim. Okay. Okay. I read it incorrectly. Okay. I thought it's it Machim, like the angels or something. I thought, okay. Okay. No, no, no. It, it, it means. No. I'm writing it, it means from from harsh diseases, actually. Okay. Okay. It means from harsh diseases or plagues. God forbid. So it's 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 very uh, appropriate now. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now we now graduate to the next the, the final part of the morning blessings. All of these until now are really about awakening. Nodaani Asher Yatsar, where we thank Hashem that, that our bodily functions are working. The long, the second Modaani, which was the long Modaani, which was the intense, thank you God for returning our soul. <clears throat> the long list of blessings, which are situational. <clears throat> the personal prayer of give me a give me a good day. Now we move on to the section called Birchas Torah. The study of Torah is a mitzvah. Mitzvahs require a bracha before them. Quite frankly, a person is really not supposed to study Torah unless they have first recited these blessings of the Torah. Okay, read the instructions right here. One must be extremely scrupulous concerning the blessings of the Torah. It is forbidden to utter any words of Torah before these blessings are recited. So really, when we get up in the morning, it's important for us to go through the morning blessings and go right here. An interesting, important concept. You know, there's the, something called the Zman Kriya Shema, the time which, for, by which the Shema must be said. And this doesn't apply for women, but it does apply for men. The Torah says that the Shema should be recited when you go to sleep, and when you awaken. What does it mean when you awaken? And the Mishnah goes into great detail, deciding the time, the last time by which the Shema should be said. It interprets into an actual time. It's not the same time every day, because there's something which is known as Sha'os Manios, which is Jewish time. And I don't mean Jewish time, like whatever time it's called for, come 25 minutes later. That's not what I mean. Okay, real Jewish time is as follows. You have daylight hours, okay? Daylight is from sunrise to sunset. According to Jewish law, a sha'a, a sha'a is not defined as 60 minutes, an hour. A sha'a is defined as one twelfth of the daylight hours. That is a sha'a. So if the sun rises at six and the sun sets at six, it's a 12 hour day. A sha'a, a Jewish hour today, is 60 minutes. However, if in fact the sun rises at 6.05 and it sets at 7.15, then the entire day is not 12 hours or, or 600, 720 minutes. It's longer than that. What do we do? We divide the daylight hours into 12 equal parts. And that is what a sha'a, what a Jewish hour is today. So if we have to recite the Shema by the fourth hour, it'll be the fourth hour of from sunrise until four, however many minute hours. Let me give you an example. I'll share my screen and I'll show you what I mean. Let's go to Chabad.org or our site, Chabad of the Valley. Okay. When we go to our site, let's go to the calendar. Today. Let me click on today. Okay. And we look here at halachic times, halachic zmanim times. So the first thing that we know is that dawn, dawn is the beginning of light. It's completely dark. It's the darkest time of night. And then it turns. And in a moment, it's known as the morning star. <clears throat> From this moment on, it'll start getting lighter. Every minute, you'll see a little bit of a progression of lighter. So finally, the earliest time for Talis and Tfilin, known as Mishiach here, which is that it's light enough that you could recognize 
a familiar person from six to eight feet away, or you could recognize the difference in color between blue and white. We've mentioned this before. So finally, you get to sunrise, 6 a.m. So for the record, by 5.11, it's starting to get light. By 5.45, it's very light, but the sun hasn't risen yet. Okay. The last time for the saying of Shema today is 9.23. But let's understand how they came to that. All the way at the end over here, you see what it tells us? It tells us that a Sha'azmanit, or a proportional hour, as we're describing, today is 69 minutes and 6 seconds. How do we come to that? Because the sun rose today at exactly 6 a.m. I was just guessing out of the blue, okay? But the sun rose today at exactly 6 a.m. And the sun set today at 7.42 so that comes to, if anybody is good at math, feel free to chime in over here. But that comes to how many minutes? That's 13 hours and 42 minutes. 13 hours and 42 minutes. 13 hours and 42 minutes is times 780 plus 42. It's about 822 minutes. Is that right? Am I doing this right? Hold on, 782 divided by 12. I don't have it exactly right. That would come to 65 minutes, okay? If you do the exact calculation and you take the exact amount of minutes and you divide it into 12 equal parts, that's what an hour is today. So hence, 923 is the Zman Kriya Shema. So Shema has to be said by 923 today. So if you want to fulfill the mitzvah properly, let's say you're going to a minion that starts at 930. Are they gonna, or that starts at 9.15 or at 9 o'clock and they're not going to be up to the Shema by then. So what you need to do is you need to recite the Shema before you daven. Every Shabbos morning we go through this, which is why in the newsletter we always put the last time for saying Shema. Friday night in Shul we always announce when is the last time for saying the Shema because even though you're going to daven a little bit later, you need to make sure that you recite the Shema by its proper time. This applies to men. It doesn't apply to women because women are not obligated in positive commandments with a time limit like this. Having said that, if I want to recite the Shema, I can't just go recite the Shema unless I recite the morning blessings and specifically the Birchas HaTorah. Because Shema is a part of the Torah. You're not allowed to utter even a word of Torah without having first recited the Birchas HaTorah, the blessings over the Torah. So, <clears throat> therefore, before, if I'm going to be davening at 10 o'clock this Shabbos, then I will make sure that sometime around 9 or 9.10, that I will make sure I've said the morning blessings and specifically and most importantly said these blessings over the Torah because otherwise I couldn't say Shema. Not to mention, can't share words of Torah. Let's say you're going to Shul and you're, you have a custom where you're sitting and you're studying before davening. We have a Hasidist year Shabbos morning in Shul with Daniel Zeberman or wherever else you may be going where you're learning before davening. You have to make sure you recited these blessings over the Torah because you're not allowed to learn any words of Torah or even recite words of Torah until you've recited these blessings. Now, there are all together two blessings here that we recite. The first one is a typical blessing that you would say before the doing of a mitzvah. And again, before the mitzvah of study Torah, this is the blessing we recite. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you God, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, our God, the King of the universe, Asher Kiddushanu, that he sanctified us, the mitzvah sub, with his mitzvahs, his commandments, v'tzivanu, and he commanded us specifically, al divrei Torah, on the words of Torah. Okay? You want to know why it says the word Sora and not Torah? That's a grammatical thing because when you are in the same phrase and the word before, if you have a word that's a, what's known as a, I, I should, I would have to show it to you, but it's known as a Beged Kefes letter, which is a, a word that starts with either a Bet, a Gimel, a Dalid, a Kuf, a Fe, or a Tuf. Okay. Those are all letters that sometimes have a dot and sometimes don't. If the word before one of those letters ends in what's known as an ehevi, an aleph, a he, a vav, or a yud, then the next word that starts with a base, a gimel, a dalit, or more, more importantly for us, a base, a, a pe, or, or a saf, or a chaf, a, a chaf or a saf, will start without the dugage, without the dot. Hence, it says divre, so therefore the word is sora instead of Torah. Later on, we see the word Torah, so. So here, it's with a tough, 
because it didn't get affected by the word before it. If you followed, great. If you didn't, don't worry about it. This was not meant to be a grammar class. Okay. Just try to every once in a while throw things in for people who are familiar with much of what we're learning so that there's some things in there that we're learning new as well. Having said that, the, the words here are al divrei sora, just so that you know. <clears throat> in the Nusach Ashkenaz, they have a different blessing. Their blessing is, Asher Kedishanu V'mitzvotav Tzivanu, La'asok B'divrei Sora. What's the difference? This says, you commanded us on the mitzvah of learning Torah. <clears throat> Similar to Al Natil Yadayim, Al Sfir Omer, on the counting of the Omer, on the washing of the hands. The way they say the bracha in Ashkenaz is La'asok B'divrei Sora, which is to to engross yourself, to toil, to delve into words of Torah, okay? And I guess the difference being that even if you're not delving, you still have to make the bracha. Because even if you're just reciting, you still have to make the bracha. So that's our nusach of how we say it. Okay. I'm skipping the paragraph for a minute, okay? To show you the next blessing. Blessing number one is this one. Blessing number two is... Asher Bachar Banu. This is a blessing everybody knows. Bless me, Hashem, our King Master of the Universe. Asher Bachar Banu Mikolvanim, that He chose us from all the other nations. Benasan Lano Estar. So, and He gave us His Torah. Baruch Ata Hashem. Bless me, Hashem. No Sein Ha Torah. He gave us. He gives. Not He gave us. He gives us the Torah. This is also the blessing that we say when a person gets an Aliyah. They recite this blessing as well. Now, the reason for why do I need two brachas for Torah? I'm going to learn Torah. I'll say a bracha. Why do I need two? I need two because one represents Torah Shebiksav, the written law, and one represents Torah Shabal Peh, the oral law. And as we know, we've discussed this many, many times. We certainly discussed it in Perkei class just two weeks ago. Torah Shebiksav is the actual written Torah, the five books of Moses, the books of the Nevi'im, and Ksuvim, etc., Tanakh. And Torah Shabbal Peh are all of the explanations that Hashem gave to Moshe, and subsequently Moshe handed down to Yoshua, and they handed down from generation to generation to generation the discussion of what Hashem actually meant in the very, very concise, almost cryptic wording of Torah, everything that it really meant. That's Torah Shabbal Peh, which in the end was put, even though it was always done orally, it was put by Rabbi Yudha Anasi into writing, when he published the Mishnah, or they call it, he redacted the Mishnah, because he took all of the teachings, and he, as he compiled, he did a lot of deleting, okay? There were so many teachings that he didn't include. They became included later in the Brisa, etc. So that's known as the Torah Shabbat Pes. So we have two blessings over the Torah. The first one is a blessing over Torah Shabbat Sav, the written law. And the second blessing is over Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral law. And then we say that paragraph in between the Ha'arevna, interesting paragraph, okay? And let's mix it up here. Let's, hold on a second, please, move this over. Let's read this one in the English, okay? The Ha'arevna. Lord our God, make the teachings of your Torah pleasant in our mouths and in the mouths of your entire people the house of Israel, and may we, our children, and the children of your entire people, the house of Israel, all be knowers of your name and students of your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Hashem, who teaches the Torah to his people. So technically speaking, you have a third blessing in here. Because in the middle of the first blessing and the second blessing, we have the bracha here, Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you, God, Hamalame Torah liamo Yisrael, who teaches Torah to his nation, of Israel. Okay? So, why three brachas? If in fact there's Torah Shabbat Sav and Torah Shabbat Peh, really two brachas is enough. Why do you throw in the third? So, the fact that it's three brachas is representative of Torah Shabbat Sav al Divrei Sora, and then Hamalamed Torah Lamo Yisrael. The second blessing is representative of what within the handed down oral law, as I mentioned to you, Rabbi Huda Hanasi compiled or redacted the Mishnah. But after he redacted the Mishnah, as the subsequent generations of rabbis over the next few hundred years continued to study and to delve deeply into the Mishnah, discuss it, 
understand the sources of where these rabbis stated their laws within the Mishnah. That eventually was compiled by Ravina and Rav Ashi, and that became known as the Gemara, or the Talmud, or the Talmud Bavli, primarily, the Gemara. So within Torah Shabbat Peh, you have the Mishnah and the Gemara. Hence, we have three brachas. The first bracha, al Torah, is for the Torah Shabbat Sav. The second bracha, al Torah Lama Yisrael, is for Torah Shabbat Peh, specifically the Mishnah. And finally, the third bracha, Asher Bachar Bano, is for the second part of Torah Shabbat Peh, which is the Gemara. Okay? And that shows us now these beautiful Birchos HaTorah that we must recite every day. As soon as we do that, you now see the next paragraph of Vayadaber. Now, we said blessings. These are all blessings, asking God for things. Blessings, thanking God for giving us the Torah. And these beautiful words make Torah pleasant on our mouths, we ask Hashem. Let us know it. It's beautiful, beautiful words, right? And blessings for those who study your Torah. And then we say, Vayadaber Hashem Moshe Leymar. And Hashem said to Moshe, Daber el Aharon vel of Leymar. Speak to Aaron and his children and say, This is how you should bless the Jewish, the, the, the Jewish children. Say to them, I don't know, anybody following here? Where on earth did that come from? We're obviously getting into right now what is known as Birchas Kohanim, right? These are the words that the Kohanim get up every time they do the blessings and they say. They, they mumble those words, and then they say this out loud. Hashem should bless you and guard over you, you know. I have to share with you when, you know, in many shuls, and our shul is not necessarily a stranger to this, sometimes during the Duchanim, not all of the Kohanim are as musical as some of the other Kohanim. We call them musically challenged. Over Yantif, we weren't in shul. We didn't have Duchanim. And we were doing everything in our home to create the environment of being in shul. So first of all, everybody was talking during that. No, I'm kidding. So we did everything that we could to create an environment that felt like shul. So when it came time, I said, you know what? Let's do the duchening. Not going to do with Hashem's name, but let's do the duchening. So I started pretending to be the chazan. Ay, 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 repetition of what I was saying and they just kept on going and it was it was quite a sight and quite something to hear and then they would take turns being on key so that it would really have the exact feel of the way it is not only in our shul but in many shuls although I have to tell you that the first time I was ever in 770 for for Birchas Kayanim was the most unbelievable experience first of all there's different tunes if you go to a Svartic shul they have a different tune that they use even within Ashkenaz there are three or four different tunes depending on which Ashkenaz community they come from originally, whether it's from Germany or from Poland or from wherever. And then there's the Chabad tune, which is the one that I was just, just started to sing. So it was really the first time I was properly hearing the Chabad tune for Duchening. The first time I was in 770 for Yantif. It may have even been Rosh Hashanah. And you have to understand that there's the Chazan. There's, you know, 6,000 people in Shul. And there's probably 500 Kahanim up there, maybe more. And when you get enough people together, the majority of people in life can carry a tune. That's the truth. Even if not so well, they can carry a tune. So when you get a large group of people singing together, ultimately it's on key. <coughs> and the sound of <laughs> so many kahanim singing the duchening was, it was beautiful, doesn't begin to describe it. It was like being transcending into, uh, transported into a Beis HaMikdash. It was unbelievable to hear. It was really Truly something special. I actually shared with many people, maybe even everybody on my WhatsApp group. If you didn't get it, send me a WhatsApp. I'll send it to you. Before Pesach, um, one of the most renowned Hasidic singers, Avraham Fried, who's been doing this for close to 40 years. He's an amazing singer with an incredible voice. He's also a Kohen. And Avraham Fried, you know, you know the, if you know the singer Benny Friedman, that's his uncle. If you know the singer's eighth day, it's their uncle too. Yossi Marcus, uh, Ellie Marcus, his uncle too. Anyway, he was the original of the great Hasidic singers. So he got his sons together and he did the Berchas Kohanim. He said it and they responded. It's absolutely beautiful. If anybody's interested, send me a WhatsApp text 
and I will find it, a link to it or the video itself and send it to you. Anyway, so back to where we are. Why are we doing the Birchas Kohanim now? What is going on over here? And the answer is as follows. We recited a blessing. And the way things normally go is that when you recite a blessing, usually you do the mitzvah right afterwards, as we, we talked about last week. You say the blessing for Sfer Omar, you count Sfera. You say the blessing for the Lulav, you shake the Lulav. Now, technically, you don't, for whatever reasons, you don't have to immediately study Torah after reciting these blessings. But nonetheless, we do. We've adapted a custom or adopted a custom that as soon as we finish the blessings over the Torah, we start reciting words of Torah. So we begin with, as soon as we finish the, again, three blessings of the Torah, Al Divrei Torah, Hamala made Torah Liamo Yisrael, No Sein HaTorah. After we do those three blessings, then we start reciting words. So we start with words from the Torah itself, Torah Shibksav. Why do we choose these blessings? Well, these words, perhaps because they're blessings. These are, this entire section is Birchas HaShachar, morning blessings. They're all about blessings and asking God to bless us. <coughs> so as we conclude the section and we want to recite words of Torah, we recite the words of the Torah where God tells Aaron, this is how you should bless the Jewish people. And then we recite the actual blessings. So we recite this Vayadaber, Hashem told Aaron, so you shall bless the Jewish people. And then we go on to the Ivarecha, which are the actual words Hashem said. Ivarecha Hashem v'yishmarecha. Okay, and these are the, the priestly blessings. And then we finish the Pasuk after that. I will put my name on the Bnei Yisrael and I will bless them. Then, just to be sure that we're not only um, going to describe Torah Shevik Sav, we also bring down a paragraph from Torah Shabal Peh, a paragraph from the Mishnah. So here we have a Mishnah, and we recite the following Mishnah. These are the things that have no exact measurement or limitation. Many times you have a maximum of what you're allowed to do or a minimum of what you're allowed to do, whatever. But these don't have a maximum. Or let's see how, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, he describes it in the English, that there's no fixed measure prescribed, okay? You have... Peya, does everybody know what peya is? That's, these are some of the laws of farming. That um, when a person is farming, we have an obligation to leave certain things for the poor. One of the things we leave for the poor is the corner of the field. So um, th that's the meaning of the word peya. So there's no fixed measurement for that. It's the corner, okay? Bahabikurim. Bikurim is the first offering of fruits that we would bring each year for the holiday of Shavuos. Um, and then you have the Vahar Ayoin, okay, which is also the way it describes it over here in the English is the pilgrimage offerings brought when appearing before Hashem on the on the Shalosh Regalim, okay. U Gemilus Chasadim, kindness. So there's no another job. Oh, that's it. You know, especially you're too kind. You can never be too kind. There's no such thing as too kind. You can always do more than milas chesed. B'salma Torah. And the study of Torah. Parenthetically, why are we talking about all these crazy things now? I understand we want to learn a Mishnah, but you saw that when we wanted to learn <clears throat> a part of Torah Shabbat Sav, we made sure to take something that was pertinent. It was all about blessings. What is this about? Well, the blessings that we just recited, recited were the blessings over the Torah. That being the case, we found the Mishnah which talks about the importance of the study of Torah. So in the first part of the Mishnah, it mentions that of the things that have no measure, there's the study of Torah that has no measure, no fixed measure, you can always do more. <clears throat> now it goes on. Elu devarim, these are the things that man eats the fruits in this world. But the principle stands and lasts into the next world as well. The Elohim, <coughs> these are they. Kibbutz Avaim, 
honoring father and mother, gumilas chasadim, acts of kindness, v'hashkamas beis hamidr shachas v'arvis, rising up to go to the study hall to study in the morning and in the evening, v'hachnasas archim, hospitality, inviting in guests, u'bikur cholim, visiting the sick, v'hachnasas kala, and taking care to bring honor to help um, a kala, a bride, celebrate, v'halavayas hames and escorting the dead, the iyun tefillah, and the delving into the prayers, the havas shalom shemein adam lachaveroi, and bringing peace between one person and another, uvein ish ishto, and between a man and his wife. And of all of these things, we're not only, we, we, we reap the fruits in this world, but they last with us in the world to come, the salma Torah keneged kulam. And the study of Torah is equal to all of them. <clears throat> Hence, we chose this Mishnah to be the Mishnah we would learn after the blessings of the Torah because it explains to us the value, the inherent value of the study of Torah, that it's representative or it's equal to all of the mitzvahs. Okay? This ends the section of the Siddur known as the Birchus HaShachar. All of these things are designed to be recited at home. So, just to recap, we wake up in the morning. While we're in bed, we sit up and we recite the Moda'ani while still in bed because it doesn't have Hashem's name. We then ideally immediately will wash the Tilat Yadayim, will wash Negevasar, preferably at our bed so that <clears throat> we don't end up touching anything with our hands which are have elements of impurity on them from sleeping. We then refresh ourselves, go to the restroom, brush our teeth, shower, dress, etc. And once a person is dressed, we wash the tilat yadayim a second time. This time it would be at a sink, preferably a kitchen sink, not a bathroom sink. And now we're ready, ideally, to recite the morning blessings. After we're dressed, before we eat anything, before we do anything else, we wash negavasar a second time, the tilat yadayim a second time. <clears throat> and then we would just recite all of those blessings that we've learned about over the last two weeks, beginning with on the tilat yadayim all the way through Asher Yatsar and the long list of blessings and everything else that we discussed today, the Yehi Ratzons and the blessings over the Torah. Now, I would also strongly, strongly advise that when you finish these blessings, unless you know for a fact that you will be davening with a minion or right now davening at home, but that you'll be davening at a time where you're sure to recite the Shema before Zaman Kriya Shema, before the last time for Shema, if you don't know for sure that's going to happen, and as soon as you finish the morning blessings, Turn to the page and recite all three paragraphs of the Shema to make sure that you fulfill the mitzvah properly. Again, I'm talking now to men. Women don't have that obligation. Okay? As it relates to women davening, just parenthetically. Technically, a woman doesn't have an obligation to daven either because, it's again, it's, it's time-bound. Though she doesn't have the obligation to daven, if she's able to daven without it getting in the way of being able to run her household, especially taking care of her children, certainly she should. Even if it means she's davening chakras later in the afternoon, that's also permissible. The timing is not the issue. If she's unable to, she shouldn't get nervous or stress over it because it's understandable that she's unable to and it's not incumbent upon her, it's not required upon her to do so. <clears throat> However, if she can daven, she should. If a woman is certainly during child rearing years and unable to daven, she should try to take upon herself to daven at least morning blessings. And if possible, once a day, maybe let it be mincha every day, or let it be mirev every day when the kids are sleeping, if she can. It's a good thing. But ultimately, <clears throat> the obligation is not the same as it is for a man who absolutely must <clears throat> make sure to daven and do so three times a day. So again, as it relates to the Shema, men certainly, once you finish the morning blessings, it's a good idea to recite the Shema then unless you know you're going to be going to a place to daven when it's the, the, the right time. And again, in a normal world, you're going to a 7 o'clock minion, and the Zman Kriya Shema is 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you have nothing to worry about. Today, everybody's on all these crazy schedules. The Zoom minion they're going to are later than usual. Shabbos certainly is always later than usual. It's just something to keep in mind. Once we finish the morning blessings, now we go about our business. Everything else that we're going to find in the Siddha that we're going to start touching upon next week is going to be... Um, <clears throat> everything is going to be the stuff that starts in the shul. 
So next week, we're going to get into the things that you say when you arrive to the shul, followed by the section known as karbanos, or the offerings. And following that, we'll get into more of the meat, even more of the meat of the davening, which is the Pesukah de Zimra, the uh, verses of song of Baruch Shamar, etc., etc., etc. I'm just going to take a quick look at the calendar. When is Lagba Omer? Anybody know? Is that next Tuesday night? Anybody know? Yes? Monday night? I'm here. Let me look. Let me check my... Box. Monday and Tuesday, according to Google. Monday night, you think? We'll begin in the evening of Monday, May 11th. Okay. So, fine. Mm-hmm. So, it is as of now, I would assume, that being the case then we can have the class Tuesday night. Monday night, I don't have it, all the details yet. My hope is that we're going to put together a beautiful kumzitz <clears throat> with a bonfire that I'm going to put together with my family in the backyard. And I'm going to get all the information out. I'm going to encourage everybody to make a barbecue. I'll tell you what's on the menu. Don't forget to buy it. I'll even give you my secret recipes of how to cook some of the stuff, possibly. Okay? Some of my secret recipes are not my own secret recipes. They're my wife's. Some of them are mine. We'll see what we're willing to share. But I'm going to encourage everybody to join and start a barbecue around 7.30 at night. <clears throat> and then sometime at time, around 8 or 8.30, after it gets dark, we'll do a kumzitz, me and my boys, around the fire. My big boys, my little boys, the guitar. We'll sing, we'll harmonize, we'll tell stories about Lagba Omer and other things. And we'll try to do it either on Zoom or on a YouTube broadcast or possibly both. I'm working on the technical details because the audio quality in Zoom is limited. So we may end up doing it on a YouTube broadcast. I'm going to do a bunch of testing to figure it out, but I'll keep everybody informed. And you're welcome to join us. I know if Rabbi Ari's having a class, you can come after that. Maybe he'll defer to the Kumzits and join us, and we'll have him say a few words. We'll find out about that too. Um, and then I suppose Tuesday night we can resume talking a little bit more about Lagba Omer and then going through the uh, continuing on in the next parts of the Siddha. If there are questions, then <clears throat> mind you, I kept the actual talking part of the class to 57 minutes. So good for me, maybe 58. Um, thank you. Um, if anybody has questions, yes, can... Rabbi. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in the uh, blessings before the reading of the Torah, it says, uh, when we ask God, may the words of your Torah uh, pleasant in our mouths and in the mouths of all your people, the house of Israel. Well, it, our mouths are the people of Israel. Isn't that redundant by saying your people? We're the people. Okay, it's a good question. <laughs> so the answer could possibly be that when we say the theme, and when we say in our mouths, we're talking about the people that are standing here around us. And then we say, Bechol Amcha Beis Yisrael, all of your people, we're talking about beyond the confines of the room where, where we may be standing. We're okay? all, but it's your people. You see, your people, period. Because we're the people. It's Israel. It's, we're all his people. So again, if, if you're saying, when you say, may it be, so think of it this way. Very often, I'll say a prayer to God, and I'll ask for something for myself and my family, and right. realize, and everybody. And always include the and everybody. Because sometimes I'm speaking about us, and sometimes I'm speaking about the larger us. So this is saying, may it be in our mouths. Our. Uh, the key our. word is our. But the our there doesn't necessarily mean the entire Jewish people. It means more our, me and my surroundings, and then being more specific, the entire Jewish people. Well, I understand okay, your then. question. It's not a bad question. That's my simplistic answer. I'll see if I can look Thank into you. finding a better Thank answer. You. No, no, I appreciate it. Because the third thing says, in the house of Israel. So right. it's repetitive three times. It's our mouths, the people of Israel. No. Your Am people. Am Israel is an expression. Okay? It's, if you look at the Hebrew, let me, let me share the screen for a second, okay? Okay. Hold on. What page is that? He's talking about page eight. Okay, so the Harev Nashem Elokeinu as Divrei Saraskel Befinu Hashem may it be may you make it pleasant the words of your Torah Befinu on our mouths 
Right. This, this is a one phrase expression. Amcha Beis Yisrael, your nation, the people of Israel. That's how we're described. When, when we talk about ourselves, we don't just say Amcha. We always say Amcha Beis Yisrael. It's common throughout prayers. Achinu kol Amcha Beis Yisrael. It's just a very, very common phrase that's used. It's not redundant. It's a description. Okay. When we say your nation, we always describe us as your nation, the people of Israel, the house of Israel. Okay, thank you. So it's redundant. Once, not twice. <laughs> okay, thank you, Rabbi. Okay. I have, a couple, I have a couple of questions, please. Okay. Um, in the May Be Your Will on page eight, and it says to protect me, I always include a whole slew of people that I know, and then I, uh, then I uh, end that little section with the, and I'll call you Israel, and then I begin to say this day and every day. Is that allowed? There are places where we add in our own prayers. In general, I mean, if you're not in the middle of a blessing, you can. I don't necessarily know that this is specifically one of the places. You're talking about on page eight, you said? Yes. It's a top prayer. Yeah. And I say it in English, sorry, but I say it in English, and then I add a whole slew of people's names, usually those who, you know, just people that I care about, who are dear to me, family members and whatever, and then also maybe other people, I may not even know them, who I know need refuel shlemas. So I, I would suggest, I would suggest as follows, that, that, on the one, that, that blessing is meant to be a personal one, so yeah, you're personalizing it. I would though, rather than saying their names within the middle of the paragraph, I would mention their names upon the end of the paragraph, not in the middle of it. Because oh. the paragraph itself is specifically written with a specific liturgy by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi that he wrote as a personal prayer. Now, the fact that you want to include within your personal prayer everybody else is wonderful, but I would say it outside of the paragraph as opposed to inside of the paragraph. But then if I'm saying it outside the paragraph and I'm adding all these people's names, it's it doesn't say for this day and every day and all those things. How well, would I? When you say that, you, you have in mind that you're including the this day and all those and, and, and every day for everything that you're saying. The whole paragraph is for this day and every day. And then when you finish the paragraph, you'll just add in those names. Okay. My other question is when you're saying to have the Shema said before the latest Shema, are you saying the one on page 16 or are you saying the one in Shakrut? The one in Shachrit, all three paragraphs. Okay, so then what is the other one for? The one on page 16. The one on page 16 is, we're, we're going to get to it, okay? That's in next week's lesson. So then we would say, if we were going to be saying the Shema, the Shema before that prescribed time, which now I know I don't have to worry about it anymore, okay. but um, what I'm trying to say is, um, so then you can take it out of the Amidah and just say it separately. Right, you just say it by itself. You see, you start with the word okay. Shema Yisrael and you finish with Hashem Elokeichem Emet, which when we get to that, we'll talk about the details of how Hashem Elokeichem Emet is said differently when one is saying it privately as opposed to when one is saying it with a minion. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. Next. Thank you. I have a question. Hi, Rabbi. It's Jill. Hi. I have a general question, but it's also specific to me. I'm wondering if you have an opinion about whether it's better to say the prayers in Hebrew, but not fully understand what is being said, but if a person, namely me, who could read them in Hebrew, but not understand 100% of what's being said, but would see the letters, or is it better to say it in English and understand 100% of what's being said? I've heard there's something about Looking at the letters, it's very important. I don't know. Do you have an opinion about this? Yeah. Generally speaking, there's two sides to this. There's the importance of understanding what you're saying, because it's not lip service, per se. But there's also the importance of the actual utterance of these holy words and of these holy letters that were orchestrated and composed by the holiest of people in a very specific way. And when you translate it into English, a tremendous amount is lost in the translation, not only in the meaning, but in the essence of the words as they're projected in Lashon Kodesh, in the holy tongue, as opposed to being projected in English. It's 
best, my suggestion would be if you're fluent in Hebrew and you can read the Hebrew well, it would be a good idea to spend some time to look at each paragraph and at least to have a note and even write it down on a page, write it down in your center, a note of this is the paragraph about the Torah. This is the paragraph about, so at least when you're saying it in Hebrew, if you don't know the actual meaning of everything, you have the general gist of what this is about. And then, in addition to that general gist of what it's about, you're saying the exact words in the Hebrew. Some would say, no, just say it in English. But generally speaking, from what I've seen in all of the communities I've ever been involved in, that most people who are able to recite it in Hebrew do so. But by the same token, it's always best to make an effort to understand it as much as possible. Okay. All right. Last question. Okay. Anybody? All right, then. Let's see if we can get everybody firstly to everybody who's willing to show your faces. Because like I said, I love to see people. Everybody loves to see each other. We're having such a hard time not seeing each other here. And I'll also remind you all that um, tomorrow night, Rabbi Ari has class. Now he's starting a new JLI course. I think it's four weeks. And it deals with certain aspects of Pirkei Avos. It's not going through Pirkei Avos through a mission of the way we do it. It's more about finding concepts from within Pirkei Avos and learning about those aspects. Um, it's a very, you know, the JLI courses are very, very specific and they're done the way they're done. Um, we will have the Pirkei Avos class Thursday where we're going to go. We're starting next week, chapter four. We'll go through, hopefully we'll have time for at least two Mishnayas. And as we go around from to, to the next cycle, we're going to keep going within the Prakim, within the chapters of Pirkei Avos. And we'll do our best to learn through one or two Mishnayas in depth with commentary and explanation of the Rebbe, etc. Um, I don't yet know, I believe, hopefully Rabbi Morty will have his class Saturday night. And then, as I mentioned, next week, Monday night, I don't know how it co coincides with Rabbi Ari, I'll have to be in contact with him, but we're going to have a Lagba Omer event, hopefully a kumzitz of some sort. I will encourage everybody to join us and sing along and have your own barbecues, and we'll feel the spirit of unity as best that God will allow us to do so during these times. Um, if we can unmute everybody, uh, I'll do that now so we can all say goodbye and good wishes. And Bye. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi Green. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi Green, thank you so very much for the class. I really enjoy these classes. Thank you. I, I enjoy finally having a chance to see people. Not to mention, can you imagine my family must thank be going you. crazy? I'm talking at them all day. <laughs> thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.